Hello and welcome to part two of our look at agricultural geographies. At the end of part one, we were in the second agricultural revolution and we were recognizing that our population was growing rapidly in the 20th century. There started to be some concerns about carrying capacity. You recall that in the late 1700s, Thomas Malthus was saying that we were hitting this catastrophe or this dilemma where our food production wasn't keeping up with our population growth. Well, there were concerns again in the mid 1900s that our population growth was exceeding our food supply. So we needed to work together. We needed to, to come up with some international solutions. And the third agricultural revolution was kicked off by an American by the name of Norman Borlaug. And Borlaug was a PhD and he went to Mexico in the 1950s and he was, he was studying different types of plants. He was looking at how to create hybrid seeds, disease resistant seeds, seeds that will grow to maturity faster. So Borlaug really introduced science into agriculture. Uh, he, he introduced concepts from chemistry and bio, um, excuse me, biology into growing more um, high yielding crops, more stable crops, and producing food for a much larger population. So Borlaug led the effort of combining science and governments. So recognizing that you know, we need to feed people and governments in order to have a stable society need a fed society. If a government is, is experiencing mass famine and people are starving, then you're going to see a tremendous amount of political and economic instability follow. So the Green Revolution, again, adopted science and this mutual effort among governments to feed people. The Green Revolution, Increase the use of synthetic fertilizers, fertilizers that can help produce higher yields. They increase the use of mechanization and mechanization through, again, the, the basic farming practices that were introduced in the, the second agricultural revolution, like seed drills and tractors, to widespread irrigation. By irrigating the land on a mass level, we were able to double our arable land, meaning we were able to create twice as much land that we could use for farming. And they also introduced this idea of monoculture, growing a single crop on these massive farms. So by specializing our agriculture, growing single crops in certain areas where they grow best, we're able to produce much more food and feed many more people. Governments wanted to stop famine. Again, you can't have political and economic stability if a large part of your country is starving. They also wanted to share knowledge. How can we best work together to feed people? How can we understand what was happening early on with Borlaug in the 1950s and 60s and adopt those practices to South and East Asia? We need to subsidize production. We need to help our farmers pay for their, their inputs, meaning their fertilizers, their seeds, and we also need to protect them against price shocks. So if we produce too much or the demand goes down, that farmers could stay in business. Uh, in the United States today, we have what's known as the Farm Bill, where we, we heavily subsidize farmers to make sure that we have grain and dairy available to our population. So these ideas, this type of knowledge sharing, this type of subsidization was beginning to spread around the world to help your farmers become more efficient. The results of this were that yields were way up. Again, we, we hit this population boom in the 20th century and we were worrying about that second Malthusian dilemma and we found that it never came to be. We were able to create cheap food in a tremendous surplus so that certain countries were able to send their surplus to other areas that might be struggling. And as a result, over a billion people are believed to have been saved, staving off famine for over a billion people. And Borlaug ended up receiving the Nobel Prize. So this Green Revolution, again, adopted these different components of science, applying chemistry, biology, into better um, utilization, better understanding of how to grow our crops. We, we incorporated more mechanization. Again, we reduced the need for labor by creating a more mechanized farming system. Irrigation expanded our arable land. We are now growing monoculture.
We are growing massive fields, sometimes thousands of acres of a single crop. In the third agricultural revolution, we saw beginning in the 1980s, a little bit of a shift. And this is where we separate the green from the gene revolution. Now the green revolution, again, was using science and expanding technology and irrigation to growing more crops. It was government cooperation so that we could work together, we could share knowledge, we could subsidize farmers. Well, in the 1980s, we started to see some corporate influences where farming transitioned from family farms into what's known as agribusiness, where multinational corporations began to, to operate farms as part of a much bigger system. They started to patent these seeds, these high yielding seeds that were produced in the Green Revolution. By creating patents, they were able to exclude users or make people pay for the seeds. Pollution increased as a result as well, because we were increasing the use of synthetic fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides. So while these were good at eliminating parasites and growing our yields uh, fuller and, and more rapidly, they also led to more soil and water pollution. And we also started to see issues with farmers' debt. So no longer were the government subsidizing, but companies now were entering contracts with individual farmers. And these farmers, again, would work as part of a larger integrated process, a system. And farmers were becoming increasingly debt-ridden by engaging in farming practices because they needed to adopt these certain measures in order to produce greater yields, in order to be competitive. But they found themselves oftentimes at the short end of contracts with some of our multinational corporations. The uh, symbol or the, the target of the gene revolution is uh, Monsanto. And oftentimes Monsanto is, is the example used when we critically analyze what's happening in the gene revolution. Monsanto has been incredibly effective at growing high producing yields, uh, disease and drought resistant seeds, pesticides like Roundup. But at the same time, they have incredibly strong copywriting. They, they limit uh, intellectual property or the use of intellectual property for adopting their science and technology. And as a result, it becomes increasingly difficult for farmers to remain profitable or at least um, above board by working with companies like Monsanto. And the gene revolution really reflects commercial agriculture in the United States today. Sorry about that. Commercial agriculture in the United States today, again, reflects this modern gene revolution and the, the adoption of farming practices by multinational corporations. The image on your screen is that of a, a poultry farm. If you're from Maryland or if you've driven through Maryland uh, on the eastern shore going down to the Atlantic beaches, you've most certainly have driven through uh, this commercial form of agriculture the poultry farm. The poultry farm is highlighted by vertical integration. What this means is that large companies like Purdue and Tyson's, they own every aspect of poultry farming. They own the, the different grow houses that they contract out to farmers. They own the processing centers. They own the distribution channels. They own the science and the research and design behind um, increasing our productivity or increasing their productivity. So this idea of vertical integration just means that they run every aspect of the, the growing, the farming, the distribution of poultry. And while we often think of, of monoculture as crops, we, we're seeing that our farms also reflect monoculture and that we either have chicken farms or hog farms or livestock farms. So we're, again, we're seeing that single uh, product, that single form of agriculture being practiced on the land. We're seeing an increase in what are known as factory farms, which is very intensive. And here you can see the, uh, the grow houses for chickens. And again, they're called grow houses because the goal in commercial agriculture is to grow your product as rapidly as possible. So chickens on the eastern shore of Maryland grow rapidly and they grow in these houses, these, these long facilities where they're basically just fed and stored until they're ready to slaughter. And you can see the, the retaining ponds that are located around these grow houses, these factory farm buildings. And these are areas that collect pollution or runoff from all the manure that's produced by intensively growing these animals. 
here's a look at the inside and again um, not a, a very uh, th this image isn't reminiscent of pastoral farming where you're out in the country you're out on the free range this is a better example of what farming looks like in the United States today. And again, this is just an example of chickens, but this is a similar practice when we look at other animals such as hogs or beef cattle. And these practices are extensive. They, they consume a tremendous amount of land. So while the, the animals are packed into these grow houses, the amount of land that this uh, type of agriculture takes up is tremendous. And one of the concerns with agriculture is that we are seeing a dual society evolve between those that are farming and working the, the, the plants and animals and those that are running the agribusinesses. So for example, the owners of these farms that are contracted with Tyson's or Purdue don't make a lot of money. Again, oftentimes year after year, it's difficult to make ends meet. A lot of the labor is minimum page migrant labor, but the multinational corporations increase their revenue streams, increase their profits year over year. So a concern with commercial agriculture reflects, again, that, that dual society, those that are working and producing versus those that own the companies. The opposite of commercial agriculture is what's known as subsistence agriculture. And this is a common form of agriculture around the world today. Um, while commercial agriculture dominates in places like North America and Europe, much of the world, billions of people, still rely on subsistence agriculture to meet their needs. And here, unlike commercial agriculture, the farmer is the consumer. So in commercial agriculture, we have a farm produced for hundreds of people. In subsistence agriculture, the farm produces for that immediate family unit. Whereas commercial agriculture is defined by monoculture, Subsistence agriculture looks at diverse, mixed cropping, mixed livestock on smaller plots. The image on your screen shows you a, uh, a small subsistence farm in the Andes Mountains, again, where you have your animals and your crops working together. Your animals help um, fertilize the crops. They, they eat off the land. They're not being fed um, food that is sent thousands of miles. The, the crops that are produced here are, are, again, used to feed the local family. Oftentimes, the, the livestock is used for milk and not used for meat. So we see, again, a major shift here between commercial and subsistence. This type of farming is intensive, meaning it uses a very small piece of land. And it's oftentimes creative, where they don't have that large extensive space. You can see here the terraced farming that, that exists in hilly areas. And pastoralism, some individuals move throughout the year or they, they go from high ground to low ground, high ground in the summer when it's hot and low ground in the winter when it's cooler. Sometimes they move from rainy to dry season. So this idea of pastoralism where, where we move our livestock throughout the year would be an example of this subsistence agriculture because pastoralism counters those factory farms. Think about where you might see a local example of subsistence agriculture. When, you, when we look around, we see the growth of urban farming. We do find some smaller plots that, that are present in North America. We do see some, farm, uh, some farms that would fall into subsistence agriculture in Maryland. But for the most part, we're finding commercial agriculture locally. But if we look hard enough, we could see where subsistence agriculture can be identified in uh, places like North America and Western Europe. 